Okay, welcome back. So this uh, final list lecture is going to be concluding the section on lists as well as introducing the idea of iterators. Up to this point, we have talked about the array implementation of the list ADT as well as, of course, discussing what the list ADT was before that. We then we talked about the array implementation and the previous lecture, then we talked about the linked implementation. And so what we're going to be talking about today is introducing the idea of the doubly linked implementation as opposed to last lecture, which was more properly termed the singly linked implementation. So these are the two we've got so far. And if you're wondering where this table comes from, it's on the back, at, back of packet 9, the, the list packet. So if you're downloading the packets from the web, this is the last page. And of course, I'm covering, with a piece of paper here, I'm covering up the final column. We'll talk about that in a second. And I point that out to you simply because this isn't exactly legible off the uh, Elmo that I'm talking from. So uh, you can at least see what I'm pointing to, but what you really want to do is have um, that packet, the last page of the packet in front of you, so you can at least re make, make, uh, make out the words on the, on the page. So what we have here is a comparison between the singly linked and the contiguous, contiguous and the singly linked uh, uh, implementations of the list class for various functions that we might list. So we have your insert, whoops, insert after, and insert before, and remove, which we've talked about. Um, some of these we've talked about increment and decrement current. We refer to them as forward one and back one in previous lectures. These, this is a slightly older table, so I use a different name for it. Um, and then head and tail, which would position the current element or current pointer either at the front of the, of the list ADT or at the end, respectively. We've got, of course, the ability to do things like retrieve, which we talked about above that, the length of the list, which we could just get by returning size, and above that, find, which would involve a search. And then here we have some of the standard uh, big three. You know, we have a regular constructor, and then the copy constructor, destructor, assignment operator, the big three, and the clear function. And if we look at the uh, table, we can see that there's uh, a great number of similarities between the two implementations. So for example, for three of the four functions that manipulate the current pointer, they run in constant time both on the array and the, the uh, linked versions. It's easy to position, assuming you have a tail pointer, as we point out on the little footnote, assuming you have a tail pointer in, built into your singly linked list, it's easy to jump to the beginning or the end of the list, linked list or the array, and it's easy to move forward one. The one thing we did see last lecture, though, is that while the array, as we saw two lectures ago, can move back relatively quickly, if you, I mean, if you want to decrement your current, you just say current minus minus, or current equals current minus one, and that reduces the index by one, and now suddenly you're pointing to the previous cell. That's a constant time operation. With the singly linked list, however, we had to start at the beginning of the list and traverse up to the cell right before current, and then assign current to, um, to uh, that, that temporary uh, pointer we've been using to traverse upwards along the list. The idea was that we could not move backwards easily in the list, so moving backwards involved starting at the beginning and moving forwards until we were just before the point where our current was. And so if you look at that, there's an advantage of the uh, contiguous implementation is that moving backwards runs constant time rather than linear time. On the other hand, you can see in the second of the four sections, the comparisons of insert after and insert before and such. And though, though updating the current element is constant for both implementations, if you're going to insert after or before or remove, we saw that for the array, all those were order n in the worst case or the average case, because you need to start shifting elements to make room, or if you remove an element, shift the other elements down to fill that hole up. Where for the singly linked version, the reason we might use linked memory is so we can insert a new element into the sequence just by changing a few uh, pointers. And so we were able to insert after or before in constant time both. And we were able to remove in constant time as long as we were not trying to remove from the end of the list, which is the other footnote we have there. And, and we discussed last time how if we have a dummy element or, or what we'll talk about today, the doubly linked list, we'll be able to remove from the end in constant time anyway. But assuming we have no dummy, dummy element and it's a singly linked list, removal from the end would be linear time, but all other removals would be constant. And that's much better than the array. The third of the fourth sections, those are all the same for both implementation. When you're dealing with uh, find, when you're dealing with a search, your worst case is that you search the entire structure unsuccessfully, and that's going to be linear time in both cases. Um, retrieve, we've already looked at for both implementations, and as far as length, you're just returning the size variable. 
So those times listed there, linear for find, constant for length, and retrieve are understandable. And it's, it's, you, know, you can see that it would be the same for both implementations. And so the main difference seems to be that the singly linked suffers in moving backwards, but it gains a great deal in inserting uh, and removing elements. And since inserting and removing elements from various places is part of why we would use the list ADT, that suggests that the singly linked implementation is going to be going to generally be considered superior to the contiguous implementation uh, in, in, in most situations. One other thing we might mention here is in this top box, I have for the contiguous memory the destructor listed as constant and the clear listed as constant. And you should really take that with a grain of salt. Those are often going to be order n, just like the singly linked versions. Certainly the copy constru the constructor and the copy constructor and the operator, the assignment operator, are the identical for both implementations. But it seems like, you know, I've got listed here the destructor and clear could run in constant time on the array. And that would not always be the case. If we're going to create an array of integers, for example, and not initialize them, I can just allocate one big chunk of memory. And so um, the idea would then be if I want to destroy that memory, I can just go ahead and wipe that out and say, OK, delete these integers, and that memory is just freed, and we're done. However, if I'm going to hold any kind of a uh, user-defined object, what's going to have to happen is one by one, the system, when it destroys that array, will have to traverse down and call the destructor on each of the objects it holds one by one. And so in that case, then, it won't just be some memory voiding. You will have to iterate over the collection of cells, not just you know, get rid of the memory in one large block. And so then it would be order n instead of constant time. And the same thing with clear, because it, it relies on similar code to the destructor. So that constant time here in this first block for contiguous memory should be taken with a grain of salt. Under some circumstances, it could be considered constant time. Under many other circumstances, it too would be linear. Um, and so that's not really an advantage of the contiguous implementation. So the main trade-off here is we can move backwards quicker with the contiguous implementation. We can insert and remove quicker with the uh, singly linked implementation. And we're more concerned about inserting and removing quickly than we are about moving back quickly. So the singly linked list is going to tend, in general, there are always exceptions to the rule, but in general it's going to tend to uh, be superior to the contiguous implementation. One other interesting implementation we can make use of, however, is if we're willing to make the proper sacrifice, it's going to turn out to be even better than the singly linked implementation. And that's known as a doubly linked list. And the idea here is that we have three fields rather than two. We have two pointers, a previous pointer and a next pointer, in addition to the element field of the node. And so where the singly linked list had uh, three, had one pointer and an element, the doubly linked list is going to have two pointers and an element. And that means that the individual, um, the individual nodes are going to be linked two different ways. And if you pause me, pause, uh, if you pardon me for a second here, I need to change the battery in the microphone. It looks like it's dying. Give me 10 seconds. Okay, we're back. I figure that's better than stopping the lecture and starting all over again. So, okay, so now moving on. Um, the idea then is if we're going to draw this structure out using these nodes, what we have available to us is we still have a head element or a head pointer, and that would point to, say, the element two, which would point to, we'll just draw the list we've been using for the last few lectures, six. 8, 7, 1, and then that would be null. And in addition now, we have previous pointers pointing backwards. And then that would be null. So that's known as a doubly linked list. And the uh, doubly linked list carries with it certain advantages and disadvantages. Clearly, the big disadvantage really the, the, the only disadvantage uh, that, that would be used legitimately as part of a trade-off would be memory, one extra pointer per node. So if you have n elements in your list, you're carrying around n extra pointers because every node has one extra pointer than the singly linked version. 
And I don't want to trivialize that memory usage. That can certainly be important in some situations, but it tends to be far less important now than it used to be. Uh, back in the early days of computing, memory, uh, the hardware was really, really expensive. Memory was everything. Saving memory was a big deal. And, and though you may well be aware of this, the, the Y2K bug wasn't a bug at all. It was a very intelligent design decision. Uh, the programmers that designed those systems figured, hey, listen, we, we, if we know the first two digits will always be 1 and 9, there's no sense in s setting aside the memory to save numbers 1 and 9 when it will always be 1 and 9 and memory is so expensive. So the decision not to include the first two digits of the year was an excellent decision for the time, given the fact that memory was such a, a tight resource and, and uh, the, the flexibility of the program was secondary to the fact that that memory needed to be saved. And so that was a very good design decision, and I think programmers get a bad rap when it's called a bug. The problem was that that built an expiration date into the software. The software design was, was, uh, not, uh, it was not designed for the future uh, use past the year 2000. The concept was that the decision was made to have this expiration date built into the software. That was the disadvantage, but the advantage gained was this memory savings. And so um, there was really, to, in my opinion, a case of people trying to use software past where it was designed for. And that was the decision was made back when it was designed that this software should not be used past such and such a date unless it's going to be altered. And so um, this, this crisis that occurred was really simply a matter of a design decision that was, uh, de that was made for one set of circumstances. It was not appropriate for the other set of circumstances, which was memory being plentiful, but the year 2000 rapidly approaching. And so the set of circumstances you're facing, as we've mentioned before, can greatly affect your design and its appropriateness. And so in the early days of computing, designs that saved memory were really important. Eventually, memory got a little cheaper. And so saving every last byte by of memory wasn't necessarily the single most important thing. And often, speed was emphasized. And so um, as, as uh, those were the, the traditional trade-off was memory versus speed. And so if memory got cheaper, you could more often decide in favor of speed because you could afford to use a little bit more memory if that meant you could get a faster algorithm to work. And these days, with the advent of object-oriented programming, one of the things that's more important than memory or speed is maintainability, often. Uh, it's not always the mo most important thing, but it's often just as important or more important. That's not to say you should have your programs run hideously slow or take gobs and gobs of memory, but object-oriented programming does always have a bit of time and memory hit to it. You've got, for example, we talked about dynamic binding. You've got these tables set up in the runtime environment that enable your function calls to work. And so uh, that enables the dynamic binding, enables the runtime system to match the proper function definition to the function call that's being invoked. And so as a result of that, you're, you're just on, if using that example alone, there's going to be an extra memory hit setting up these tables. There'll be an extra time hit to do this function lookup at runtime and figure out which definition we should use. And that is not necessarily a big deal. It's just a small time hit and it's a small memory hit. If you are attempting to optimize every tiny last bit of performance out of your, out of your, or into your program, then you may not want to use that, those techniques. And there are, you know, in situations where performance is absolutely critical, networking software, for, for example, those technique, techniques uh, might not be used because speed would be the critical factor. Or, you know, in a situation where memory was very limited, memory might still be the critical factor. But if you've got a situation where you can afford to take those few extra, you know, microseconds of time hit for, or, or, or the few extra little uh, bits of memory involved in setting up those tables and such, then you might want to go ahead and say, okay, I'm not wasting time or wasting gobs of memory, but I'll, t I'll use a little more memory than I could get away uh, with, and I'll use a little more time than I could have optimized to get away with. And uh, as a consequence, I'll gain maintainability. I'll gain the ability to extend my program in a graceful way rather than having to do these massive rewrites. And as, as uh, you know, people want to customize software, they want to come out with newer versions faster, be able to add newer features faster, that idea of maintainability uh, becomes... Um, very important, and, and, and it's uh, sometimes a very legitimate concern to weigh against speed or against memory. And you may well decide, and when you use object-oriented programming, that essentially is what you're doing, you're deciding that you're not going to optimize for speed or memory, you're instead going to use techniques that will enhance maintainability of the code at the expense of a little bit of extra time or a little bit of extra memory. So that said, the doubly linked list should not be something you cringe at immediately just because we've got this memory usage. Um, one extra pointer uh, per, per value is not going to often be anything serious, 
especially these days when memory is relatively cheap. And so um, you'll often see that a list uh, class implemented in the library, and certainly the standard template library that you'll be taking a look at, its list class is a doubly linked list. Traditionally, or not traditionally, but often, library list classes will be doubly linked lists. The reason being that using that one extra pointer per cell is not a huge memory hit. You know, if you're going from, you know, order n memory uses to order n squared, that might be a big deal. But this is just adding one extra pointer. It's, you know, uh, adding a little order n uh, memory usage, and the constant's very low there. It's, you know, one, one pointer. So if you have n data memories, you're using n extra cells of memory. And that's not usually too big a deal, though it may be. But usually it's not, and so often your, your libraries then will say, I'm willing to use that extra memory for the advantages it'll give me. But that is the disadvantage, and when I say, oh, memory's cheap and kind of wave my hand, it's not meant to slough off the fact that, I mean, memory is not, is not, not infinitely cheap. But often the trade-offs we make these days will be made so that little bits of extra memory usage, like the W link list uses, will not be, will not as often as, as in the past, be legitimate worries. Our worry tends to be more functionality and, and maintenance these days um, as we write larger and larger software systems. So that's not an ironclad rule. It's not even a 99.999% rule, but it's certainly a trend. Uh, it's, and that's why object-oriented programming has caught on to some degree, because the trend is towards making programs more maintainable. Um, and, and the trend has been away from worrying about every last byte of memory if, if the trade-off is between memory and, and functionality. Um, it's not always the case, as I said, but it's, it's certainly a legitimate trade-off and so, certainly a legitimate um, um, decision to make in either direction. So we're not going to worry about the memory. That is a disadvantage, but we're going to accept that disadvantage for what it can gain us. And so the question is, uh, what, what does this gain us? And the answer is, well, uh, firstly, I now have the ability to move backwards, which means the one, uh, the one advantage the contiguous uh, implementation had in terms of speed, which was the ability to move back one, that's gone now. If I'm at eight, I can move back to six very, very easily. Likewise, I can run insert before without using that trick. I can actually insert the node I'm inserting before my current. And indeed, I can remove even from the end with, a, with no dummy node, I can remove from the end in constant, in constant time. So the, the, when, as soon as we have these pointers backwards, all those problems that came about that we discussed in the last lecture as a result of not being able to move backwards nicely, they're all gone now because we can move backwards nicely. And so that's a big advantage in terms of speeding up some of these functions that may, have, may not otherwise have been sped up. However, uh, we need to be careful because now that we're dealing with a, a multitude of extra pointers, we have a few extra things to worry about. And one of them here is, let's say we've got this situation here, um, where I have, I'm just going to do a sort of a close-up here. Let's say this is current. It'll be pointing to, you know, whatever is back here. And this points to 8, and 8 points backwards. And I want to insert, I'm inserting after current. So one thing we can do is go ahead and set up the temp node. So we've, we've looked at, we looked at this last time. Say we have a node pointer temp, and then saying temp equals new node x. So we have here a pointer temp that points to a new node containing whatever new value we're inserting. Let's say it's 9, with two pointers that are both null. And then we can go ahead and attach this node without much trouble. So I can say temp next equals current next, just like I did last time for the insert, before, or insert after function. So I can point this to 8. And I can say temp previous equals current. So that likewise is not a problem. I can point temp previous back to 6. And so 9 is attached where it's supposed to. 9 should point to 6 with its previous and 8 with its next. What we need to do now is have these pointers set up correctly. And one thing I might notice is say, well, current next needs to point to temp, and current next previous needs to point to temp. So I could go ahead and write those out. I could say that current next, which is this pointer, equals temp. And I could also say this pointer is current next previous.
and that equals 10. So that would take this pointer and point it to here, and then take this one and point it to there. And it seems like everything is OK, but it's not. And the problem here involves we have to make sure if we're going to try and design this and see how this algorithm would work, we need to make sure that each thing work, each things works uh, step, step by step. So here when I say current next, that's this pointer. When I point that to temp, I can't then turn around and say to this line, oh, this pointer is current next previous. Because it's not. Because I've moved current next now. If I take this and point it down here, which is what that first line does, now this pointer is no longer current next previous. This is now current next previous is this pointer. And what I'm going to do is point this back to itself. That is, the problem is this expression depended on current next being the old version of current arrow next. And so this line really should have come first. Then I can change current next once I finish using the old version. If I'm going to use, I could, of course, you know, rewritten that second line in a different way, too. But if I'm going to use those two lines of code, I need to use current next to get to current next previous before I can actually overwrite current next. And in the order I wrote them in, we end up with this situation where 6 points to 9, but then 9's previous points back to itself, and this remains pointing where it was. And so you can see that if you traverse forward, everything works OK. I'm traversing forward. I read 6 points to 9, points to 8, and everything is OK. And as long as I'm traversing forward, everything is all right. But when I start traversing backwards, I skip over 9 entirely. And so it seemed like when I start traversing backwards across this W linked list, out of the blue, I lose data. And the reason would be because our pointers are mis misset behind the scenes. So that's something we might not even catch when it happens. We might be way, way down in the code before something like that actually gets caught. And so it's important to be very careful. There's a number of different ways we could have gone about referring to those two pointers. But the, the point here is to make sure that you are careful when you do these pointer assignments that you don't start doing one pointer assignment when it relies on a value that you have changed in a previous line. If this is relying on the old value of current next, don't change current next before that, or else rework the second line so that it doesn't rely on the old value of current next because current next has been changed. So since you have twice as many pointers, you have to be doubly careful how you write the code. Now, that is not a reason necessarily to use one implementation over the other. The idea is, well, you should use a good implementation, and if it takes Though certainly with business concerns, you know, saying, oh, it takes too long to code might be something legitimate. But, but as far as, you know, in terms of evaluating structures, the, the, um, we evaluate things generally based on things like time and memory. We don't say, oh, it's too difficult to code. I'll do a, use a different structure instead. If this is a good structure to use, then you go ahead and code it and you use it. You're not going to want to say, well, that's too hard. I, I only want to use easy to code structures. You know, you should, you should take advantage of a, a, uh, structures properties if it, if it would be good for you. And if that means there's a coding work, then there's coding work. Um, so my point with, with that is to say that you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't let, oh, it's hard to code, become a legitimate trade-off decision. But um, certainly it's something to be careful for. Be extra alert when you write a doubly linked list versus write when you write a singly linked list. But that said, that's really all there is to say about doubly linked lists. Um, what we can do then is throw the table back up, but now I'll keep that third column uncovered. And what you can see if you look at the table yourself, you know, if you've got your own version, at, in, you know, those of you playing the home game, um, you've got the, uh, the W linked list here. It's constant for all of these. It's constant for all of these, again, assuming you have a tail pointer. It's constant for these first two, and for the, or for the se second two, and for the find, it's linear. And you're not going to beat linear for find on a linear structure. So that's OK. And then here, yes, these are all linear, and some of these are constant. But like I said, for the contiguous implementation, destructor and clear aren't really always constant. Take that with a grain of salt. So if you acknowledge that those aren't usually going to be constant, um, what you end up here is saying that in terms of speed, the fastest of any of them will always be the doubly linked list. So the array might be just as fast in some situations, or the singly linked list might be just as fast in some situations. But whatever the fastest time is for a given operation, the doubly linked list will have that time. So there won't be any situation where one of the implementations is faster than a doubly linked list. So it's definitely you're making a choice based on speed here and, and flexibility uh, at the consequence of using a little bit of extra memory. 
And so the advantage of the contiguous implementation would be the best memory usage. But again, because uh, uh, tiny bits of memory usage tend not to be a huge concern, we don't generally see a list implemented using a contiguous memory. Um, we often see it used, implemented using a doubly linked list because often speed is a greater concern than memory in the real world. And so um, at least little bits of memory, like just you know, uh, a proportional amount of pointers. And so as a result, the doubly linked list is often, uh, in just general purpose code, is often the, the chosen implementation, versus, certainly versus a contiguous implementation, and even versus a singly linked implementation. So that said, we are done with lists now. We're not done with the lecture, but we're done with lists. And so um, what that basically was meant to be was kind of an intensive study of one of the ADTs. We won't spend necessarily as much time on the other ADTs, but this was then we, we looked in detail at, as far as some of the implementation or some of the interface decisions we might encounter. And now we've looked at three different implementations for that, AD, for that ADT and the various trade-offs involved in picking one versus the other. And so that said, um, we hopefully now you have a, a, a better idea of what could be involved in designing a class. The interface decisions involved, the implementation decisions involved. And ultimately, you pick the implementation and the interface that works best for your situation. The other thing we have to cover is a slight introduction to iterators. And so this is not going to be a comprehensive introduction by any means. The TAs will go over some stuff a little bit more. Or Adam, I guess. Uh, you only have one TA for the internet course. But uh, Adam will be going over um, a little bit about iterators in the uh, fourth section video. And then you'll get a chance to mess with them a bit on MPs and such. The essential idea of an iterator is born of trying to combine uh, two very good uh, f factors for two very good means of accessing data that conflict with each other. Uh, we're going to look at two different means of accessing data, and they both have disadvantages. And the iterator is attempting to gain the advantages of both while discarding the disadvantages of both. So the first thing we can consider is what we've done up to this point a current built into the list ADT, or whatever your class is. So you've got here, and I'm just writing a singly linked list. It would, the same applies for a doubly linked list, um, or even an array implementation. But I'm just drawing the list like this. So if you have your list class here, and you have some current, that's all fine and good for situations where you just need to access particular values. But if your goal, for example, is to swap two values, you might like the ability to refer to two different nodes at once. You might, you might wish you had the ability to say, here's C1 and here's C2. And now I want to call a list swap function that would swap C1 and C2. And unfortunately, that would be difficult or impossible to do, um, at least, at least you, know, not, not, you couldn't do it easily, uh, using the um, just one current pointer. Because you can only refer to one value at once. So you could perhaps stick in a temporary variable and scoot over, search for some other spot, and you'd need to have some legitimate uh, uh, property of that spot to search for. You know, why would C2 be here rather than here or here? Search for that second spot, put that in a temporary variable Y, swap them, and then write them back into corresponding locations. It's a really big hassle. Certainly not as easy as just saying, OK, I point to two nodes, swap their values. But we can't do that because we don't have two current pointers built in. So that might suggest to us, well, since there might be situations where we would like to have two current pointers, let's build in two current pointers rather than one. We'll have current one and current two. And that's going to mean if we have multiple currents, then we need functions to control multiple currents. So I can't just have forward one or back one anymore. I now need forward one for current one and forward one for current two. Or, and, or I might just have forward one with a parameter, where I now have to start passing arguments to forward one and back one and anything else using current to indicate which particular current I mean. So insert after wouldn't just be insert after anymore. It would be insert after one, insert after two. And we're indicating which of the current pointers I want to insert after. And of course, two might not be enough. There may be an application where we need three, so we could build three into the list. And maybe three isn't enough. Maybe there's an application where we could really use four current pointers. And so we might always need one more pointer than the class 
provides. So the idea of building in current pointers carries with it a couple of disadvantages. Firstly, the more if we're going to build in additional current pointers, we need functions to control them. And secondly, you know, you, you never know how many you need. So, you know, we say we built in one before. Here's an example where we need two. We build in two, maybe we need three in some other example. So um, building in uh, a set number of currents is an unimpeeling solution for that reason, because we might always need more and, and, and there's control issues and such. So the other possibility, or a second possibility at any rate, would be to say, well, instead of doing that, let's let the user, the client, declare as many pointers as he or she wants to various parts. So we don't put an upper bound because we don't build things into the class. We simply say instead, you want a pointer, go ahead and allocate one. So now we have a list, and it's wrapped up in you know, your list object. And now you have various pointers sticking into these objects. And the problem with that is that this breaks encapsulation. So it's a nice solution from the standpoint of if the client can always declare various pointers to various nodes inside the list, then you know, you don't, you're not bounded by any particular number. You simply say, well, I've got pointer x and y and z and w and w2, and oh, I want to declare 10 more pointers, declare 10 more pointers. There is no upper bound on that because it's not built into the class. I declare as many as I want and assign them to whatever nodes I want. And then if I want to move x from here to here, I say something like x equals x arrow next. Just like I would do if I were, you know, if I had current, forward one said current equals current arrow next. Now instead of calling a function to control an internal pointer, I control the pointer outside of the class and I can directly set x equal to x next myself. And that certainly gives me all the power I want in terms of various pointers pointing to these nodes, but it breaks the encapsulation. It allows me to do something such as saying, well, if I have an exterior pointer, I can now say delete x. And that would wipe this node out without going through some sort of erase or remove function on the list, which would mean at the very least the list is all screwed up, plus I wouldn't decrement size. So there's a whole host of problems with that kind of thing as well. So it seems we're stuck because we've got this second, this, uh, second uh, option, and that allows us flexibility in terms of a large different, we can have as many you know, pointers as we need to different nodes, but it breaks encapsulation. And the previous version was very secure, but it, it, uh, we have these restrictions then that may be too restrictive for us in a given situation. Now, the idea of iterators then were, was that uh, this was a structure designed to try and get around these problems. So this is the third solution and the one the standard template library uses. Basically, it's a, a wrapper around a pointer. And the, another term for this is a smart pointer. In the same way that you saw in section two, we can wrap a class around a C++ array and create an, a, a, a safer array object or create a string object by wrapping an interface around a C++ character array. Likewise, I can create a quote-unquote safer pointer or a smart pointer by wrapping a class around a pointer. So what I do here is I still have a list. And I still have pointers into various nodes here, but these pointers are then encapsulated inside objects with various interface functions, such as operator star and operator plus plus and so on. So operator plus plus, for example, might say the code for that could be pointer equals pointer arrow next. Once again, the same line of code, whatever it is equals whatever it is arrow next. Current equals current arrow next in the last lecture. Uh, X equals X arrow next on the last slide, and now this. But we're not explicitly running that code. We would call the plus plus operator on this iterator. So let's say this is IT1 is the name of this variable, this, this whole variable here. So this iterator is called IT1. It has as a member data pointer, which points to some node. But the IT1 is the class, we can't, well, this would be private, so we can't say IT1.pointer. Pointer would be a private member data of the iterator. 
And so if I want to move pointer, I would have to say IT1 plus plus. And that would invoke the plus plus operator on this iterator, which would then run this code, which would move pointer to the next node. And so now saying iterator or IT1 plus plus essentially moves the iterator to the next node. Yet I can't call delete on PTR because PTR is not publicly accessible. The only things I can do are the operations I provided. That's the idea of encapsulation. So unlike the second solution we looked at on the previous slide, where I have this pointer just open to the world and the world can do whatever it wants with this pointer, now instead I have a pointer protected by an object and that object provides an interface, you invoke those interface functions and those interface functions then will do certain things to this PTR value but if, there, if the task you want to do to the PTR value, so it's called and delete on it, is not something supported by the interface, then you can't do it. And that allows some degree of safety because the interface you design for an iterator is only, are only the things that you'd want to do to an iterator. To a, you know, you'd want to dereference it to get the value that it points to. You'd want to move it to the next node or to the previous node or, or you know, a couple of other things, you know, plus, plus, uh, that's moving it to the next node. Um, you, you uh, might reassign it to some new, new uh, other node somewhere, for example. Or you might compare it and say are two iterators alike by comparing their, their pointer values. So there's a number of things you might do on an iterator, but they're basically straightforward operator calls, many of them. And that would be the only things you could do on this iterator. You, you couldn't uh, grab the PTR value and start messing with it. You could only do things the interface allowed. So what 3 is essentially we can now have as many iterators as we want all over the list, which satisfies the disadvantages of one. And yet, because it's safe, because we can only do certain operations that we provided for the iterator class, it's still there's some degree of encapsulation and safety, which eliminates the disadvantages of the second solution. And so we get the ability to have multiple iterators on a, on a, on a class, the list class here, but certainly any class. We have the ability to have a bunch of iterators, as many as we want, and yet, each of them is a safe means to access the list, and you can't, you can't use iterators maliciously to start destroying things in, in, well, anything can be used maliciously, but it's hard to use iterators maliciously to just tear random, uh, you know, rough shots to the list. So, what this would require on the part of the list class itself would be two functions, begin and end. And begin would send back an iterator to the first element that then this could be assigned to. So we'd say pointer equals, you know, whatever was returned here. And that would then point back to the beginning. And then typically there is an end position when dealing with at least the standard template library classes. This is what I mentioned before with the idea of a dummy node. Typically what happens is we'll view a class as having a dummy position. So let me now, um, we can view this class entirely in the abstract. It's a list, but it doesn't have to be. We don't even know the implementation. We simply say there is a data here and a data here. Let me draw these circles. And a data here and a data here and a data here. And then here's our dummy value. So begin would give me an iterator to this position and end would give me an iterator to, this, to this, this dummy position or this null position at the end of the list itself. And so once we've got that accomplished, then I can write code like this. So here's our list class. Never mind this particular syntax for now. This is how you declare an iterator. Iterators would typically be nested inside the list class. So there's your type. It's the iterator of the list class, or the iterator scope to the list class, and that's why we have the scope resolution operator. The TAs will talk a little bit more about that in section. So we have IT1 here, and then I can say IT1 equals L dot begin, where L is the name of this list. And so that tells L, return an iterator to your beginning element, and this iterator would be returned, and IT1, which was declared to be just sort of a, sort of a null iterator up here, then says, well, now I'm going to point to the same place begin does. And then we can say, as long as it's not true that, actually, let me just make that in a slightly more compact form. Um, as long as IT1 is not equal to L.N. So forget about this. While IT1 is not equal to L.N, it means IT1 is on some legitimate value. What we can do then is say, see out 
and we dereference the iterator to get its value. And then we can say iterator plus plus. So we'll dereference the iterator to get whatever value is there, print it out, and then say it1 plus plus, which will move our iterator down to the next cell. Same thing. Grab the value from that cell, print it out, move it1 to the next cell. Grab the value there, print it out, move it1 to the next cell. it1 still does not point to the same place as n, so grab the value from here and print it out, move it1 to the next cell. They still are not equal, so grab the value from that cell, print it out, move it1 to the next cell. Now it1 does equal n, so we exit and then start running the code there. So these iterators are a sort of a helpful way to refer to various locations in the list class or inside a container class in general. They're similar to the idea of Java references. Uh, we said the big difference between C++ pointers and Java references was that in Java the idea was completely abstract. You knew this reference could point to something, but you couldn't actually read the address. You just knew it referred to something, and then when you went ahead and called um, you know, some sort of a instance method off that reference, the instance method ran. And so it's sort of similar with the iterator. We know the iterator points to some implementation concept. We don't care what. It could be the array behind the scenes. It could be the linked implementation behind the scenes. The point is, I have conceptually these elements. I know my iterator points to the first one when I call begin. That's all I care about. And the iterator can just basically assign itself to various positions. The implementation is reading addresses. The iterator holds an address to some node. But from a conceptual standpoint, all we can do is move iterators around. We can say this iterator equals this other iterator, or we can set an iterator to null. And that's how we could do with Java references, too. Whenever you wrote into a Java reference, it was always some other function produced a reference, or new produced a reference, to be, or an address to be written into the reference. Or you said A equals B, and you took the value of B and wrote it into A. But you were never able to explicitly extract that memory address. You were just writing it around all over the place. And the same thing applies here. You're never able to actually pull the address out of IT1. You're just moving IT1 around to hold the addresses of different nodes and thereby point to different nodes. But it's a secure way of doing so, and therefore it, it's a very nice tool by which we can traverse around, uh, around uh, lists and define the current position for a list. And you'll see that in section when you look at the list class, for example, when you want to insert before, you wouldn't just pass in your value, you'd pass in an iterator as well. And the idea would be that whatever this, wherever this iterator points in your list, insert the new value before that iterator. And so um, now instead of passing in an index or simply relying on some internal current pointer, we can pass in iterators, and those iterators will mark various locations that are relevant for us at the time. So that's a quick introduction to iterators. The TAs will have more to say, and you'll get some practice with it. But that's the basic impetus beside, behind the creation of them, um, is the idea of... Uh, trying to get a unlimited, the possibility of an unlimited amount of current pointers while still maintaining encapsulation. And the iterator does that task, so it's a very nice tool to use. And with that, we are done. Uh, the next lecture is going to start, or start and basically finish stacks and queues. And so um, we're done with uh, lists and we're done with iterators. And I will see you in the next lecture. Take care.